So welcome, Professor George Church, to the Pod Conference. Delighted to have you and had you keynote this morning. Yeah. Um, we have ten questions that come directly from the Pod community, which represents the drug delivery sciences world. And so, if you're ready, I'll, I'll start with number one, I'm, which I'm is ready. we'll go yeah. with the basic question, which yeah. is. In what ways do recent or not so recent advances in genetic sciences open up new possibilities for medical treatments? Right, so I mean there's dramatic recent examples where we'll get some obscure fact from a bacterial uh, uh, genome that is applicable like, like CRISPR and uh, uh, various things from the virology community that provide us with new delivery mechanisms. Uh, so this is undergoing a, a revolution. Um, in going from discovery quickly to uh, therapeutic tests. Okay. All right, number two, given the slow adoption of many new approaches, over what time scale do you feel that some of these approaches might become widely available and allow medical practices to change? Right, so some of these uh, revolutions are uh, happening very quickly. I mean, so for example, the, our ability to read and write DNA uh, was supposed to take six decades, instead it took about six years. The CRISPR is only four years old. There'll be clinical trials. There already are clinical trials um, for cancer, and there soon will be some for inherited blindness. So on the, um, the tr transplantation using CRISPR to engineer humanized pig organs so they can be transplanted into humans. The, those will probably be ready for non-primate trials within a year. So this is happening very quickly. All right. Number three, how do advances in genomics and DNA sequencing influence precision medicine? So it's really hard to do precision medicine without uh, being able to read uh, genomes, both, both our human genomes that are constant, that are inherited, but also our human genomes that vary from day to day. Uh, like the cancer somatic mutations, or our epigenomes that change, or our microbiomes and virome, the, the viral and microbial components. And this is all enabled by the fact that the cost of sequencing has dropped by three million fold in a very short period of time. I think very few people anticipated that, and it continues to drop um, with new technologies like the nanopore technology. It will probably be, soon be everyone can, will, it'll be part of your cell phone, it'll be portable, uh, it'll be part of, we'll realize that we were blind to all the environmental allergens and pathogens and that, that, we, that we're surrounded by. Number four, what are your thoughts about the future of DNA delivery and how that can change the current way of treating diseases? Well, uh, DNA delivery is a, is a, a big deal for gene therapy. Um, for a whole variety of the, uh, different diseases. We would like to be able to deliver it. Uh, some tissues are easier than others, like retina and liver and, and blood, relatively easy. We'd like to get it so we can deliver it to anywhere mm -hmm. and everywhere. So that for some things, like say aging reversal or something, that we'd like to be able to deliver it to almost every cell in the body safely and efficiently. Um, and there's many promising viral and non-viral uh, delivery strategies um, and cellular delivery strategies. So really promising. Very so. Yeah. Okay, number five. Uh, where do you see the major application of CRISPR gene editing technology in the future and why? Ah, uh, yeah, great question. So major application of, of CRISPR, um, I mean the first thing you think of are rare genetic diseases. So like orphan drugs, mm -hmm. um, orphan drugs with protein deli delivery, this would be um, gene, gene uh, therapy, but the other opportunities are for infectious diseases. So you, you can see there's anti-HIV uh, for AIDS patients, pos there's uh, hepatitis, uh, B virus, there'll be herpes virus, there'll be quite a number of opportunities. And these will be bigger markets and it will help drive down the cost of gene therapy and genome editing. And you've already had success in HIV, haven't you? There's already uh, success with, uh, with uh, genome editing in uh, HIV by killing the, the, the T cell uh, component that is the receptor for the HIV virus, CCR5. 
Um, but you can also use, uh, if you have a, a DNA intermediate, you can use CRISPR for what it does in nature, which is attacking the DNA of the viruses. So you can use it in two different ways. One is getting rid of the receptor, the other is attacking the virus directly. Okay. I was going to say number six is for which type of diseases, but you, you've touched yeah. on that. Yeah. So we'll go into seven. Um, for in vivo therapeutics, uh, would the hurdle for more widespread use be the delivery system and its challenges or safety risks associated with gene editing uh, as such? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the, the, the safety risks of off-target uh, cleavage, for example, I think is probably going to turn out to be not that significant. I mean, cr CRISPR could end up, or gene therapy uh, in the form of gene editing could be, end up being one of the most specific and, and uh, best safety profiles of any drug because you can you can empirically determine exactly where on target and off target is, um, and also theoretically predict it. Um, and it, it really obeys the laws of, you know, of Watson Crick DNA. Um, so I think, but all of these things, of course, have to go through all the, the clinical trials. But it may be that we get a, a, a class of uh, therapeutics where, you, where each new one is, has, it kind of inherits the safety record of the previous ones. But time will tell. Uh, which role, this is number eight, which role and value do you ascribe to gene editing of the microbiome and why? Right. So the microbiome uh, is a, a different but interacting part of uh, any therapeutic. We have, uh, um, I'm involved in some companies like Ceres and, and uh, Fit Biome that, that are aimed at engineering the human microbiome for either uh, lower dysbiosis, as you might get with clostridium difficile infection, where it's an absence of normal ecosystem. And rather than having an uncontrolled and well, poorly characterized therapy like uh, fecal transplant, you want to have a, a well-defined and FDA approvable uh, set of, of uh, microorganisms that have a high shelf life. Um, and then there's various pro probiotic, where you're not dealing with dysbiosis, but some more health oriented uh, applications I think could, could be quite interesting as well. Um, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not gene editing in the same sense as you might do on, on, on a human being. It might be managing the ecosystem. Uh, some of them will, uh, will, will be classified as GMOs and some of them will not. Okay. Thank you. Okay, number nine, what are you particularly excited about for the future of genetic science? Uh, I'm uh, particularly excited about uh, uh, two things. One is, uh, is delivering uh, uh, cures into developing nations via things like gene drives where we can deal with nematode diseases, malaria, maybe even Lyme disease, which is not a developing nation problem, um, by going after the, uh, <clears throat> by spreading through the population either uh, doses of uh, toxins or antibodies that are specific for those organisms by spreading them exponentially through the population via gene drives um, or reducing the population directly. Anything else you're excited about? Dealing with diseases of developing nations and the other is in industrialized nations, most of us die of diseases that are, um, that don't kill 20 year olds. These are diseases of aging. Um, even if you don't consider aging itself a disease, uh, it probably is uh, addressable. Um, and there's a, quite a number, uh, about 300 genes that have been identified in animal models uh, and a subset of those which look like they're prime candidates for aging reversal, which is much easier to do the experiments and get approval than longevity where you need a long-term experiment, aging reversal. In principle, you can see the effects uh, in, in weeks. And these can be things that affect um, strength, reaction time, uh, cognitive tasks, and so on. Thank you. Oh, number 10. Yes. So <laughs> it's a little bit silly, but I think there's also a serious aspect to it, which is to say, since your appearance on the Stephen Colbert late night show, has he been pestering you to bring back the woolly mammoth? <laughs> uh, well, it, it's, a, it's a side project that benefits from, uh, from the funding we have for curing human diseases, um, kind of as we bring down the costs, uh, we can do it, we can apply it to things like ecosystems and uh, conservation and, and uh, mammoths. 
Um, we've been, we're pestered by quite a few people. It, it is one of our most popular side projects. So it's not particularly Stephen Colbert, no, no, but by no, many it's, others. It, many people. <laughs> and some tell of us them, why. And I think that uh, a part of it is, it's probably the most charismatic uh, extinct species. It's not a hyper carnivore, so it doesn't have quite the Jurassic Park uh, okay. problems. <laughs> uh, it has the positive aspect, both for the endangered Asian elephant species that you can expand their uh, ecosystem from right now, they're in constant conflict with humans that surround them to a, a almost human-free environment in a very sparsely populated Arctic gigantic ecosystem in Russia, Canada, and Alaska. So it's good for the Asian elephants. It's also good for the environment from a human standpoint uh, in that they, by um, but reducing the insulating snow in the wintertime and increasing the reflectance of the grass in the, in the summertime, uh, it has been shown that they can impact the soil temperature by up to 20 degrees, um, trapping uh, the carbon in there, which is more carbon than all the carbon in all the rainforests of the, of the world. Keeping that frozen is extremely important, so they could contribute to that. Thank you so much. That was our 10 questions, yes. and uh, it's a pleasure to have you today yes. at the conference. Thank you very Thank much. You. Pleasure to be here. Thank yeah. you.